So we've titled our talk Artificial Intelligence, Medical Diagnostics, and the Limits of Certainty. Medical diagnosis proceeds with a singular goal, to identify the set of subjective and objective findings that demarcate a patient's illness in pursuit of correct identification of disease. As clinicians, we often fail in this elementary medical decision-making step. Regardless, medical diagnosis remains a central aspect of patient care, the fulcrum on which the therapeutic relationship rests. In fact, the inability to achieve diagnosis is a significant cause of patient dissatisfaction with medical providers. Making a diagnosis is a complex cognitive task that involves both logical reasoning and pattern recognition. Richardson, Wilson, and Gaia describe the process of medical diagnosis as involving two essential steps. In the first step, the clinician enumerates the diagnostic possibilities and estimates their relative likelihood. In the second step in the diagnostic process, the clinician incorporates new information to update the relative probabilities, rule out some of the possibilities, and ultimately choose the most likely diagnosis. Thus, with each new finding, the clinician moves, albeit intuitively and implicitly, from one probability, the pretest probability, to another probability, the post-test probability. To put it another way, predictions are central to medical practice. The delivery of medical care involves an educated prediction of what will happen to the patient in the future, given their present condition, and how treatment or prevention might alter the natural course of events. Fuller and Flores have described this process as involving two distinct inferences in series, a generalization of a risk measure from a study population to a target population of interest, and a particularization, a transformation of this measure to yield probabilistic information about a particular patient within this target population. So many proponents of artificial intelligence view progression from data gathering to diagnosis and treatment as limited by the finite nature of human analytic capability. If we assume that to be the case, AI then may be a valuable tool with which to refine this process. This early optimism has been most significantly realized in algorithms designed to identify malignant skin lesions. In a recent publication in the journal Nature, a multidisciplinary group from Stanford developed a deep convolutional, convolutional neural, neural network, a CNN, that performed on par against 21 board certified dermatologists on a recognition task to discriminate Carinocyte carcinomas from benign seborrheic keratoses and malignant melanomas from benign nevi. A similar technology has since been developed that outperformed 58 dermatologists on the tasks requiring the clinicians and algorithm to identify malignant melanomas and properly segregate these cancers from benign lesions. Likewise, Siddhartha Mukherjee and the New Yorker speculated about the ability of AI to identify early signs of stroke on the CT scan, which could have profound implications for our ability to intervene to improve upon outcomes. So we'll show two short videos about these topics now. We built an algorithm that using a single image can classify skin lesions as cancerous or benign as accurately as board certified dermatologists. Neural networks, also known as deep learning algorithms, are a type of very powerful machine learning algorithm. And the way these work is that they are fed massive amounts of data and they are told what they are looking at. The hope is that this would be a starting point into bringing AI and computer vision to the healthcare and really extend the reach of providers well outside of the clinic. Can you give me a smile, big smile? Give me a big smile. technology has a tremendous amount of data built into the system of where these arteries are, what these arteries should look like, 
and where there should be blood flow. And when there's interruption in that blood flow, it sends off an alert. So the goal now is to get the clot out of the brain as quickly as we can. If we cannot get this clot out of the brain, that this whole area of, of uh, brain that you see here in green, the whole area will be dead most likely. So, you know, what we did in this case is use a smaller bore catheter to, to grab the clot. This is actually the culprit for all his, his symptoms, uh, and now we have it outside the body and, and we have full restoration of flow. Hello, Dr. Devlin. How are you doing there, sir? Pretty good. How are you? Good to see you. So these examples represent applications of visual pattern recognition and image analysis. In the first case, the AI must be able to correctly identify the characteristics that distinguish a malignant skin lesion from a benign one. And in the second case, the AI must be able to differentiate between a subtly abnormal CT scan and a normal one. In both applications, the goal of applying AI has been not only to develop an algorithm that builds on human cl clinical knowledge, but also one that identifies patterns and features that humans are unable to see. Yet both cases diverge from the diagnostic process that is typical of many, if not most, other clinical situations in which subjective evidence, for example, the patient experience of illness, informs a clinician's understanding, gathering, and interpretation of objective data. In daily practice, clinicians are often faced with the need to make decisions based on incomplete information, in spite rather than because of inconclusive evidence. Further, as frequent as the clinical encounter in which clinicians are able to achieve a diagnosis, is the clinical encounter in which a preliminary diagnosis remains elusive. It has been estimated that physicians are unable to reach a diagnosis that accounts for their patient symptoms in nearly 90% of outpatient patient encounters. A more recent review provides more generous estimates, suggesting that concern over unexplained symptoms account for 10 to 15% of all general practice consultations. Some authors have postulated that these failures are the results of the limits of human cognition, and as such, represent an opportunity to enhance medical care through the introduction of tools such as AI. However, some advocates of this hypothesis may be disappointed to find instead that the AI diagnostician will not offer answers, but rather probabilities. In philosophy of mind, naive right realism is the idea that the senses provide us with direct awareness of objects as they really are. Recent lessons from physics have put into question the idea that observation can lead to certainty in the physical world. How might these lessons fundamentally change our understanding of medicine? Does our understanding the process of diagnosis and of diagnostic certainty need to change? This set of questions leads to two divergent perceptions of uncertainty in decision making. On the one hand, some view uncertainty as fundamentally undesirable and argue that optimal decision making is based on the minimization of uncertainty. On the other hand, uncertainty may be seen as the core feature of the decision making process and a fundamental component of the exercise of weighing the likelihood of various diagnoses and courses of treatment against each other. This latter viewpoint is exemplified by the now famous case of the IBM research Watson supercomputer stint on the game show Jeopardy. So now we're going to dive a bit into a case study on the IBM Watson program. As mentioned by Sunit just now, Watson was applied initially in the game show competition Jeopardy, and later was applied in the medical sphere as a cancer diagnostic tool at Sloan Kettering. So we'll focus on the Jeopardy case first in order to build up an understanding of the algorithmic infrastructure that is behind Watson. In 2011, Sony Pictures and IBM agreed to a two-day event in which its IBM Watson program, which was spun out of the Practical Intelligent Question Answering Technology program led by Dr. Dave Perucci, competed against two of the best Jeopardy champions of all time, Ken Jennings and Brad Rutter. It was sold by IBM as a pivotal moment in the history of intelligence and computing, and 
clearly they wanted a very public win. This is a risky venue to showcase the power of its technology. And they knew because the stakes were so high and this was such a popular show, a victory something like this would impress the public at large. So we'll view a little clip from Watson's run on Jeopardy. I remember that morning going to the lab and I was thinking, this is it. This is the last Jeopardy game. This is Jeopardy, the IBM challenge. Here we go. Brad, if you're ready, make your first choice. Let's take alternate meanings for 200, Alex. Four letter word for a vantage point or a belief. Brad, what is a view? Yes. After the first clue of the game, which Brad won, I had just this horrible feeling at that moment that he was as good as everyone said he was, and he was just going to run the whole board on us. Watson. What is shoe? You are right. We actually took the lead. We were ahead of them, but then we started getting some questions wrong. Watson. What is leg? No, I'm sorry. I can't accept that. What is 1920s? No. What is chic? No, sorry. Brad. What is class? Class, you got it. Watson? What is Sauron? Sauron is right, oh. and that puts you into a tie for the lead with Brad. The double jeopardy round of the first game I thought was phenomenal. Watson went on a tear. Watson. Who is Franz Liszt? You are right. What is violin? Good. Who is the church lady? Yes. <laughs> Watson. What is narcolepsy? You are right, and with that, you move to $36,681. The risk was, Ken gets a daily double, bets big, gets it right, he's gonna be well ahead, and then with that kind of lead going into Final Jeopardy, if he bets enough, he could end up winning the match. Ken, what's a committee? We gotta find that last daily double. We gotta find that last daily double. It was a crucial moment in the game. There was still a daily double on the board, and it was starting to become uh, pretty clear that it was in the legal ease category. Let's go to legal ease for 1,200. Watson. What is executor? Right. Same category, 1,600. Answer, daily double. <laughs> that was the moment when I knew it's over. The category is 19th century novelists. What Watson wants to do then is preserve the lead, not take a big risk, especially with Final Jeopardy, because just like for humans, Final Jeopardy is hard for Watson. Now we come to Watson, who is Bram Stoker and the wager. Hello, 17,973, and a two-day total of 77,147. I would have thought that technology like this was years away, but it's here now. I have the bruised ego to prove it. My past Jeopardy experiences have been great, but they weren't really weighty with this kind of technological, philosophical importance. I think we saw something important today. Didn't really think very much about the implications until later and say, wow, wait a second, this is history. Of course, this whole project is not ultimately about playing Jeopardy. It's about doing research and deep analytics and a natural language understanding. And this is about taking the technology and applying it to solve problems people really care about. We're just so excited about all the things we can do with this. I had thought this is the end. We get there, we're done. And I'm realizing it's just the beginning. So for those who didn't catch the scores at the end, it was a runaway win. Watson accumulated $77,000 approximately, and Brad and Ken each had roughly around $20,000. So Watson quite handedly won the game. There were unique challenges that the IBM team had to face in developing this system and preparing it for this competition. This is a race against human competitors, and these are trivia masters that often immediately know the answer to a question right after reading it. The computational power that Watson would require in order to match the speed of these human competitors is monumental, and this presents a large computational challenge for the system. There's, of course, the element of wagering probabilities and the game theory behind Watson. Watson's confidence in an answer is weighed against the dollar values of his question, as well as 
the amount that it has. And of course, there are special scenarios in the game, double jeopardy, final jeopardy, in which the contestants have to wager some of their own winnings in order to get even further ahead. But these challenges pale in comparison to the last one listed here, which is the irregularity of questions that Jeopardy presents. Now, as many of you know, Jeopardy doesn't really present its questions in a conventional manner to begin with, with them giving you the answer and you providing the question in the form of what is, who is, answers. But furthermore, some of the questions have elements of wordplay. Some of them are simply phrases that you have to make sense in context from the category. And so there's a categorization and a language understanding problem that Watson must encounter and be able to work through if they were to have a chance to form hypotheses for these questions. That's all. Watson is what we would call a query machine. And an ideal query machine is developed according to these four broad steps. It has to process a human phrase question into a set of search aims, very similar to how many people use Google and other search engines. It has to find bodies of knowledge that contain information relevant to the query. And this can include academic papers, encyclopedias, patents, legal case summaries, and many other forms of literature. There can be even feeds from news wires that Watson reads and incorporates into its body of knowledge. It has to identify relevant information within these bodies of knowledge about this specific query. So this represents the core of the challenge Watson faces, being able to identify key concepts from literature and how they relate to each other in a variety of ways and using these relationships to train and best predict what is an answer to a question provided to Watson. And finally, Watson has to synthesize a humanly comprehensible answer that most likely satisfies the query. It has to accumulate all of its hypotheses, weigh them against each other, rank them, and present the answer that it is the most confident in. The architecture underlying Watson is known as deep QA with QA standing for query and answer. DQA is based on an algorithm that some of you may be familiar with and some not, known as deep learning. Deep learning comes from the University of Toronto, from Dr. Jeffrey Hinton, and broadly what it is is the ability to perform very advanced and nuanced pattern recognition by the fine tuning of layers of weights. A set of training data is used in which inputs are fed through the layers of weights and with matched to their complementary outputs, the weights are tuned such that once the actual test data is fed to the system, after it has been trained, it can then be able to hopefully accurately predict the output that best matches that input. So shown here is a detailed workflow of DQA, and we won't go over it in too much detail to save you the headache of trying to understand it all, but essentially what the steps are is first the Watson system tries to decompose the questions and topics. As mentioned previously, there are many different types of ways the question can be phrased, it can be wordplay, it can be conventionally presented. It then tries to identify the type of question and subcategorizes the question in order to give itself a framework to work within when looking for conceptual relations between passages in the text that Watson is searching through. This is the question decomposition stage. Next comes hypothesis generation. Initially, what the Watson system is attempting to do is create as many possible answers as possible. There is no filtering to begin with. And what it all is doing is it's going through the bodies of literature that it has processed and has stored on its system in order to find how the concepts presented within the question relate to each other and how they best relate to other concepts that it then finds from other pieces of literature. Watson is trained on the entire history of Jeopardy questions, so it has a bit of a sense of how concepts within questions should relate to the answer that matches the question best. Hypothesis and evidence storing happens next, in which the hypotheses are filtered through a two-step process. First, a soft filtering step, in which lighter algorithms are applied, and then a more thorough, hard filtering step that narrows down the list to the top 100 candidates of possible answers that Watson believes best matches the question provided. Evidence is scored according to several models that DQA 
accumulates together. These models allow for different sorts of relationships to be examined. For instance, blocks may look at the, sub, the subject verb object predicate relationship. It may look at things like the geospatial locations of certain um, areas presented within a question. If Watson identifies that the question leans towards a geography slant, it may look for temporal relationships if Watson identifies that the question is within a category of history. These scores are all weighted together in a dependent manner. And then finally, the hypotheses are merged. The most similar ones are merged together and the scores are combined. And they are ranked against each other to output final scores of confidence. And then provided that the confidence of its highest ranked answer is higher than a set threshold, Watson will then buzz in with that answer. The IBM team optimized the system to have 85% precision at 70% of questions attempted with less than five second response. So that was a very broad scope explanation of how Watson worked, but you can tell that it's a very tangible, objective, and well, computational way of trying to determine its confidence in an answer based on relationships that it has studied in its training data. This is a statistical confidence, a quantifiable objective metric. The human competitors, on the other hand, they're doing something that is much more intuitive and harder to discern. The, we can argue about the nature of intelligence and how people can synthesize answers so quickly when they know an answer immediately, but that's outside the scope of this talk. We all know, though, that the sensation of knowing something intuitively is one that is not something that is well described and is just something that we feel if we're certain in an answer to a question. This intuitive confidence is a subjective experience. So clearly we can see from this that the Watson thinking process does not mirror how a human Jeopardy contestant processes questions. Watson must do this because unlike humans, it associates concepts from raw data with each question. Humans, on the other hand, are capable of having an immediate instinct for whether they know the correct answer. This even allows us to reflect a bit on the notion of probability. Some of you may be familiar with the term personal probability or the likelihood which we imbue in an event from happening. In the history of statistics and philosophy, there has been much argument about the degree to which people can coherently and consistently apply a probability or a likelihood to an event provided to them. Some are very optimistic of humans' ability to be coherent, such as L.J. Savage, the first statistician to really talk about personal probability, while others, such as Kahneman and Spersky, who performed studies in the 70s that tried to assess consistent assignments of probabilities to events provided to their study groups, found that people really aren't that consistent in how they define a probability event from happening unless they qualify in ways such as almost certain or 50-50. In fact, later statisticians such as Patrick Supps presented models that took the skepticism one step further in the 1974 meeting of the Royal Statistical Society. He argued that humans are only able to consistently apply a probability to an event if it's broken down to five course categories. Surely true, more probable than not, as probable than not, less probable than not, and surely false. So if the resolution of which people can understand probability is this course, how can someone then take an advanced analytical system such as Watson that knows how to distinguish between 72% and 73% probability and know how to act on that in distinct ways in the human applied world? Despite the great success of Watson, there were still some skeptics at the end of the day. And a lot of the skepticism came from what happened during the final Jeopardy at the end of day one. So we're gonna play that. And so I believe this cuts out before showing the category, but just so you know, the category of the question is US cities. Here is the clue. Its largest airport is named for a World War II hero. Its second largest for a World War II battle. To a human, I think that's a very hard question to get wrong. And I'm used to seeing all three players nail very easy questions. So I get it right, then Brad gets it right. Watson only gets it wrong, but he names a city that's not a US city. What is Toronto? 
with a lot of question marks. Now, people look at that and say, wait a second, you know, Toronto isn't even a U.S. city. Watson's not dealing with structured databases. It's trying to understand language. There are lots of cities in the United States named Toronto. The actual city in Canada also has a baseball team in the American League. Very often there are categories in Jeopardy, but the answers to the questions are not that type of thing that's named in the category. The Watson system knows that and says, yes, U.S. City might be part of answering this question, but there are other elements in this clue that must be considered. Most importantly, the confidence for that answer was very low. It's definitely not a question that Watson would have buzzed in for if it had had the choice. The illusion is that this computer is doing the same thing that a very good Jeopardy player would do. It's not. It's doing something sort of different that looks the same on the surface. And every so often, you see the cracks. And the wager, how much are you going to lose? Oh, you sneak. $947. It looks like Watson's doing the same thing that the human contestants are doing, but it's fundamentally different. In this anecdote, it exemplifies why the public may have discomfort with an AI system operating under uncertainty. For a system to wield decision-making power, one must accept the fact that the AI will eventually, in all likelihood, lead to incorrect inferences. And as in the case of Watson, these incorrect inferences may sometimes be blatantly obvious to our human intuition. And so that's a great transition into the first application of Watson after the game show. So in the first video um, that we showed you about Watson, right at the end, they were mentioning how this was an interesting technical challenge for IBM's research team. And this would be a fun way to really show what is state-of-the-art AI. And on the whole, despite that, what is Toronto blunder, Watson pulled out on top. Um, but when we were thinking about what that moment meant, that what is Toronto moment can serve as a sort of proverbial canary in the coal mine about what happens when you apply a system or way of thinking that, yes, there is definitely still cracks in it, as Ken Jennings said, into critical situations. And in the world of engineering, a critical system is one where failure of that system leads to a loss of life, uh, financial loss, damage to the environment, in general, bad things. Um, and IBM, after the Jeopardy challenge, decided that healthcare and medicine would be the critical system that they tried to disrupt. And so over the years, IBM spent billions of dollars building out Watson for oncology. And we'll show a short clip that describes their journey well. Sloan Kettering is one of America's first cancer centers, and our mission is to care for people, but also, as part of the process, always looking to find a better way to do things. But the massive amount of data that we collect is difficult for any one person to analyze. So having the information and the wisdom at your fingertips is going to basically make every doctor the most experienced doctor in the world for taking care of that particular problem. The partnership between Memorial Sloan Kettering and IBM Watson is really at the forefront of our ability to deliver evidence-based medicine through analytic approaches to understanding cancer as a disease. What our role is is that we are MSK Watson's teacher. And just like we would teach uh, a trainee in medical oncology or surgical oncology, we're teaching the MSK Watson system. One of the ways that uh, IBM Watson won Jeopardy was that it was fed in a lot of prior Jeopardy questions and answers, and it learned the correct way to answer those. In essence, MSK Watson does the same thing, but the information we're feeding into it is how uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering doctors uh, treated Memorial Sloan Kettering patients. Watson's capability to analyze huge volumes of data and reduce it down to critical decision points is absolutely essential to improve on our ability to deliver effective therapies and to actually disseminate that information to the world. It has access to research. It's taught by specialists. It's also taught by the experience of the patients treated at specialty centers like ours. Watson learns from those cases and gives you a list of choices really chosen for you which is something we've never had access to before. 
I think this is beyond an evolutionary step. I think this is a revolutionary step. This has the potential of totally changing the way we conduct medicine. We need to get our best to other doctors so that patients everywhere can take benefit from that. Will allow us to design treatment programs and also ways to follow patients that avoid over-testing and to more effectively use a treatment to personalize their therapy. Now, I'd like to say that there's two parts of any medical problem. There's the biology and there's everything else. What Watson's gonna be able to give us is the everything else part, and that's gonna make a total comprehensive package that's going to improve results worldwide. Like one of the doctors in the video mentioned, the development of Watson can be likened to Philippe and I as we're going through our journey uh, to become medical doctors and serve patients. And although that video just shows one perspective about it, lots of institutions were involved uh, in between the moment when Watson went on Jeopardy to where we are now, about six years later. So we'll walk you through what happened in order. So our first two years of medical school um, are called pre-clerkship. In one sense, that's where the book learning happens. Uh, we study from textbooks, we have to read uh, research articles. Um, in the United States, a really popular um, learning modality for students is to try the New England Journal of Medicine's clinical pathology puzzles, which challenge students to um, integrate lots of knowledge that they're learning about to um, see how that directly correlates to patient care. And in the United States, they write step one of their licensing exam. So researchers at Columbia and the University of Maryland um, worked on training Watson, feeding it the same sorts of information American pre-clerks are fed through medical school. And at the end of 2011, um, researchers said that Watson is just about as smart as the smartest second year medical student out there. And then different institutions, as we can see on this timeline, uh, got past the torch. Um, Case Western Reserve and the Cleveland Clinic trained Watson so it can effectively pass the USMLE or the licensing exam. And then Watson went to Memorial Sloan Kettering for its residency in general oncology, where Watson learned all about lung, prostate, and breast cancers. After that, much like an oncologist at an uh, academic center like Sunit works at, Watson honed in on leukemia. And that was done at MD Anderson in Texas. IBM CEOs were really excited about that. Um, Ginny Rometty said in 2017 that Watson will be able to diagnose and treat what causes 80% of the cancer in the world. And that's a really bold claim given that just a few months earlier, MD Anderson had actually tabled their relationship with IBM and Watson. Uh, and in the months that followed, we started seeing lots of headlines like this. Um, and MIT Tech Review, Stat News, The Verge, and many others actually started blasting IBM for really letting the hype machine loose without really capturing all the nuance that cancer care involves. Um, and they did a lot of really interesting investigative journalism where they spoke to physicians and business people and engineers. And it's been a large, large issue. So this final short video. You may remember Watson from Jeopardy. The computer program beat two of the best players in the show's history. Watson. What is clock? Clock is correct, and with that, you move up to 23... IBM wants its digital prodigy to beat an even smarter and deadlier opponent, cancer. But a stat investigation found that the supercomputer isn't living up to the expectations IBM set for it, and some doctors and hospital administrators think it's smarter than it actually is. Here's how Watson for Oncology actually works now. It uses artificial intelligence to make cancer treatment recommendations. First, a patient's medical record is fed into Watson. Second, the physician will ask Watson. A few seconds later, Watson will make treatment recommendations. Let's take you behind the curtain. Watson only recommends treatments from a fixed list. It will not come up with anything new. 
It looks at the list and eliminates treatments that are obviously wrong. Then, it scores the treatments based on how appropriate they are for the patient and rank orders them by score. But Watson can explain why it gives certain treatments particular scores. That's the so-called black box of machine learning systems. They can't explain in words how they come to a decision. Stat found that the scores are based almost exclusively on the expertise of a group of doctors in New York. They've been spending years teaching Watson how to treat patients with a myriad of different characteristics. This helps Watson recommend how to treat a particular patient that it's never seen before. Watson's training does not include learning from how well or poorly actual patients fared with certain treatments. Watson splits the possible treatments into three categories, recommended, for consideration, and not recommended. Now, let's come out from behind the curtain. Doctors see this ranked list, along with published articles and statistics backing up each treatment. But while Watson can't explain exactly why it picked a certain treatment, it can provide doctors with evidence to help them make a decision. IBM acknowledges artificial intelligence in healthcare is still in its infancy. The question is, how will Watson grow up? Um, so like that video mentioned, we can see some issues coming up with Watson for oncology. The first is that Watson is manually trained by doctors at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And that's in stark contrast to other systems um, like Google DeepMind's AlphaGo Zero that learned tabula rasa or from scratch how to play the ancient Chinese board game of Go on its own. Learning from mathematical principles itself. Uh, next, Memorial Sloan Kettering is a world-renowned cancer center, but we found that these investigations by STAT and other sources found that they heavily bias American literature and guidelines, even when it may not be the best fit. And okay, that's one thing when you use Watson in America, but Watson has been sold all around the world to hospitals, such as in Manipal, India, and in Indonesia. And in Indonesia and East Asia, Japanese guidelines are really the ones that are followed clinically, not necessarily American guidelines. And when you think of the biopsychosocial characteristics of people living in um, that part of the world, they can be quite different from the generally affluent Manhattaners and New Yorkers. Um, that are treated at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And finally, we have to ask, well, what is the measured clinical impact of this tool? What's, how effective is it? Um, and there's been no research on that, either by IBM's own scientists or external scientists on hard outlines. And I have the stat here. Uh, even when Watson is found to return relevant results, it's only been estimated to have changed the course of care in 2 to 10 percent of cases between six, the 2,000 and 8,500 patients globally. That's a lot different from Watson being able to treat, uh, diagnose and treat 80 percent of what causes cancer in the world. So we've, uh, we have titled our talk as speaking to the limits of certainty in medicine and medical diagnostics. And what we will hope to argue, and hopefully we'll, we'll find it compelling for us to do so, is very fundamental to the epistemology of medicine itself. So you know, what you've seen here uh, from artificial intelligence is that the systems that we have now are remarkable probability machines. Uh, to quote from Sir William Osler, who was the founder of modern medicine. Medicine is the science of uncertainty and the art of probability. When we work as diagnosticians, we are exercising a fundamental complication. We are attempting to establish for an individual a diagnosis of certainty based on the probability of populations in which that individual might reside. In other words, 
we're trying to extrapolate from the experience of 10,000 or 100,000 what to expect for a single person. And there is a dissonance there, a fundamental dissonance. We don't often see that dissonance because we are often correct. One of the arguments made in much of the AI literature is that our ability to achieve diagnosis it will improve because AI offers a better probability machine than our own brains do. In other words, what the argument is fundamentally is that certainty is possible in diagnostic medicine, and the problem is simply our cognitive limitations. Once those limitations are overcome, we will have certainty. What we would argue is that what we've learned from these preliminary experiences with Watson is not dissimilar from coming up with the answer that Toronto is the right answer for the question we saw. Watson is built, and AI is built as a probability machine to give weight to likely answers and to give an answer if one of those possibilities is considered probabilistically feasible enough. That's not dissimilar from how we practice medicine. What may actually be the case, however, is that what AI, and particularly Watson, is teaching us in its failures is that this dissonance between the process of understanding medical illness on a population level and the certainty that we try to achieve statistically is only sometimes, and thankfully usually, but not always transferable to thinking about what reality is for a single individual. So as physicians, we're often faced with the need to make treatment decisions based on incomplete information. Uh, if we're to practice medicine alongside an artificial intelligence, we have to ask fundamental questions about epistemology and medical practice. In its nature, we would argue that medical diagnosis will always hold in it some sense of uncertainty. There are a number of dimensions among which these topics should be tackled. We would advise that trainees be taught about the folly and dangers of excessive diagnostic testing. Uh, trainees should be given a better understanding of Bayesian statistics and of statistical modeling. I will tell you, as someone who's gone through medical training, it's not something we spend a great amount of time with. But that's, at least initially, what we are learning from AI. We are performing probabilistic interpretations of end of one events. And there's a fundamental limitation to what certainty can mean in that situation. Ultimately, Watson for Oncology serves as a meaningful case study for the importance of tempered expectations about how medical artificial intelligence interplays with diagnostic and therapeutic uncertainty. Even though humans may not fully comprehend the inner workings of AI algorithms, there remain countless ways in which they can be imbued with imperfections and biases. Responsible clinicians must endeavor to acknowledge these biases, to openly discuss them with regulators, colleagues, and patients, and finally, to ensure that the messages of pundits and marketing agencies do not compromise our Hippocratic principles underlying practice. To paraphrase Kant, out of the crooked timber of humanity, no straight thing was ever made. We would argue that AI won't get us any closer. <laughs>